Okay, hi guys, and welcome to an extra special show today. We're gonna go on a little trip. Uh, we haven't done this for donkey's years. Of course, these days it's getting a little bit easier to move around. Uh, and just like in the early days of the channel, five, six, was it seven years ago? I can't even remember. But um, yeah, very, very special indeed. You're gonna see an incredible collection of watches and also one of Elvis Presley's own watches as well, the King's Watch. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so more on that in just a moment. Of course, naturally, we have to do wristwatch check. As it is such an auspicious occasion, I'm wearing the Hanhart. I know I was wearing it in the last video. Last time I had it on Risk Candy Watch Club that with the red stripe today, I'm like thinking, why, why didn't I try this combination before? It's the Valor strap, also by Risk Candy Watch Club, that I uh, designed for them. This is the first strap I designed for them, and it just works so magically with the, you know, Hanhart, the red lion, the red pusher, the crimson stripe there. It's just, you know, it's absolute perfection. Oh, and also a little bit of a, let's do a, a kit check or a gear check, shall we? I wanted to show you this, and I've been testing it out. You may have noticed in the last War Room tour, and do check it out if you missed it. Let me just turn this off on rather. So this is the Moza gimbal and you might have noticed that the shots were a little bit smoother. Now I'm still testing it out. I'm going to be using it today with the camera you're watching me on. Not This is the secondary camera. I have not tested it with the Pico uh, sound interface which goes mounted on top here so I don't know how it's going to react with the extra weight. But so far so good. It's not a bad you know, I can't give it my full recommendation just yet because obviously I still need to experience it a little bit more. What else have we got? We got the Pico um, interface, uh, which I've already talked about in a previous video. Of course, we have the Unico case, my secondary watch, and this gives you a little clue as to where we're going. The Accutron space view. What else? Um, of course, I have to talk about my new Bowen backpack. So this is an upgrade over their previous one. You guys know uh, I, I've been using Carl Friedrich, huge fan. Of, I've co-designed products with them for donkey's years since the beginning of the channel. I love their backpack, but they've done a, a new version. And as you can see, this is the biggest improvement, I have to say. They've added this padded mesh on the back and it's a singular attachment, much more comfortable than the previous version. Same variety of colors, same high quality vaquetta. I love the addition of this uh, handle. So when it's zipped up, it's just easier to move around. Logical, but these, these little changes are really worth it. They've made the outside pocket bigger, so I mustn't forget the phone. <laughs> so, you know, easy access. Um, and what else? There's new compartments inside. Again, customizable. I've added my initials. I'll include some B-roll of me out and about in New York. I tested it out the last couple of weeks. Absolutely loving it. You know, that classic Scandinavian mixed with that London influence, you know, just none of the gaudy uh, branding, very understated, works with every attire. Today it's inspired by um, Tom Cruise in <laughs> Mission Impossible, the last one. What, was, it, was it called Ghost Protocol? No, what was the last one? Fallout, that was it. He wore the suede jacket with the turtleneck. So, what else? Have I got everything? Let me just shut this laptop. Uh, keys, wallet. I got a train to New York. So, let's go. Oh my God. I just realized I forgot the, uh, the macro lens, so. <laughs> Now before we get into this, please do like this video, it's the best way to support the channel if you want to see more independent, free content like this. So, we are here at the Belova Museum in the Empire State Building on us, and I'm joined by Carl. So Carl, tell us, what is your relationship with the brand? Well, I am the historian. I'm honored to be the historian, and it's been quite a journey to be able to recreate the history and to be able to tell the story or the many stories of Bulova, not only how it was and how it has evolved, but how it can inspire the future. And to be able to tell the stories not only of the technology and the innovations, but um, about the people that wore them and the people that are passionate and the collectors from today and tomorrow. 
Where do we begin? This is, uh, my God, what a collection. Well, this is the Bulba Museum, which uh, really began in 1875 when the company was founded by Joseph Bulba. And it's been quite a journey ever since. We started the archive maybe six, seven years ago. And the intent was to not only honor the past and look back, but to celebrate the present and inspire the future. And as you'll be able to see, we are looking back to our history, to that DNA, to that root of the company, and embedding that DNA into every watch that we make today. So if we're going to start right at the beginning, I remember you had this extraordinary Lindbergh piece. In 1927, when um, Charles Lindbergh flew from New York to Paris, mm -hmm. uh, Boulevard awarded him a cash prize and a watch but they also then engaged him as an ambassador to the company. He was called the Lone Eagle because he flew alone. And so they came out with a collection called the Lone Eagle and they sold, I think the initial run was 5,000 watches, which is a lot of watches back mm. in 1927. Mm. And this corner cut that we have here on display is from 1927, an original Lone Eagle watch in the original packaging. And one thing we like to do is represent the product in the packaging that you would have seen at the time. Mm -hmm. And we have a replica here of something that would have been included with every watch uh, from Charles Lindbergh saying, thanks for the watch. It's a pleasure to wear. It keeps accurate time and it's a beauty. So um, wow. that's pretty cool. This one um, uh, was done 1931. Uh, pretty interesting piece. And it was worn by two men, Post and Gaddy, did it, the first around the world flight but they couldn't do it with one stop. They had to make 14 stops right, around the world. Right. So one thing that is interesting here from a packaging standpoint and from a marketing standpoint is this box shows the route that right, they right, took right. with all the stops That's beautiful. Uh, in this, what we call it a coffin style right. uh, thing. So the display and the marketing was also important to, to make it relevant to the consumers. You said earlier, it's like a, it shows the history of America almost. Right, through the advertising, it's America. So Richard Calamaris uh, grew up in this, this New York, New Jersey area um, and uh, was an avid collector of Bulova. Uh, ended up finding the company in a museum at uh, one of the shows for my collection. And they were ready to, to do what they do as far as changing and evolving and you know finding the historical value and, and pushing the brand forward. And they wanted to do it from a collector's perspective. And, and dig into what some of the, the ideas of the founder, you know, Joseph and Artie did in, in, the, in the beginning. And it, it's, it started a great relationship of uh, being able to, to help historically, um, help with the design, help operationally, sales, mm -hmm. and it turned into the dream job career. Beautiful. The, this orange piece here mm -hmm. is the Devil Diver. Right. Okay, and that's from like 1970, and we were able to recreate reissue, that. Reissue, yes. A reissue, yes. back to the original. But what I like is the engagement with the community. Mm -hmm. And the Devil Diver was not something that the Boulevard called it. It was the consumer. It was the collectors called it the Devil Diver because it was water resistant to 666 feet. Mm -hmm. um, the flip side of that is some people wouldn't wear a watch right. because it said 666, right. it said the sign of the devil. Yeah. So ultimately, <laughs> Boulevard changed to 200 meters for uh, water resistance. Right. Another piece, uh, which was also a reissue from the archives, is the surfboard. Not called surfboard by Boulevard, but right. you know people were very, very engaged with the product. This one is the parking meter because it's reminiscent of a, like a New York City uh, parking meter mm -hmm. with the uh, you know the crown at the 11 and, and sort of one o'clock positions. Uh, on the right is the chronograph C, according to Bulova. But what do consumers call it? They called it the stars and stripes because it's red, white, and blue. Probably about 15 or so years ago, I started, and um, it was it was an incredible journey. I was I had uh, the National Watch and Clock Collectors Museum, which has the largest archive in the world. The watch for watches is in near Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which I was living and doing business out of, and used to go there, and they were, they, I was always talking about Bulova, and I was like, you're way underrepresented. I want more product in here, which, you know, we had plenty, but, you know, I wanted more. And they were like, well, let's do a show. So I did a show, and Bulova showed up, and they were like, what is all this? And uh, I said, I'll be honest, it sounds crazy, but I'm not even close to the biggest collector in the world. There's people out there that will blow your mind. I mean, it's an amazing, iconic brand. Joseph Bulova was an incredible young man. He was way ahead of his time. Um, you talk about Ford and you talk about, you know, all these other great men of industry from America. And Joseph absolutely fits in there. I mean, he was a 19-year-old 
that was so talented that the world knew who he was in the middle of nowhere, brought him to New York, and in five years owned a building here. That was the thing about him and the family and his son, Artie, who took over late 20s, early 30s and kept the ball rolling was, it was more about what we can do. There was always a yes if, there was never a no with Bullet What other watches of yours are, are in, the, in this museum? Well, to be quite honest, in this museum, you're probably 80 to 90% are my watches. What's the connection with the Oscars? Uh, it was the first, last, and only company to be able to use the Oscar symbol. And here is the packaging where you see the little Oscar symbol um, on there as well. Bulova was not only in the movies, but they were the first company to ever advertise on television. It's B-U-L-O-V-A, Bulova Watch Time. America runs on Bulova Time. And now Bulova presents the Frank Sinatra Show. The advertisement cost a total of nine dollars, including production. Wow! Not wow. just to air it. So uh, it's been innovative. Back in uh, 1926, they were the first to nationally advertise on radio, mm. and every home in America that could get radio would be getting a pull of a time check. It's 8 p.m. B-U-L-L-V-A, pull of a watch time. Tell me about this extraordinary, I've never seen anything like this, so this is a watch for blind people. Right. Bulova has always been socially conscious and also provided for disabled people. Mm -hmm. So this watch is, a, we call it a braille watch. To open the crystal, you press the crown and the crystal pops open. And then you actually feel the time with your fingers because you know, before digital, you know, it would have to be something tactile. And in this case, you can see how worn that watch was. That was the only way that person would be able to tell time. Yeah. And from a technology standpoint, from a movement, the movement had to have enough torque to have that extra pressure. And also to resist yeah. it. And the hands had to be strong enough that they wouldn't bend. What I have here on display is one that was very well used and sort of a virgin piece. So it started out with white right. and, and you could see uh, the transition. That's fantastic. We have all of this great innovation and the history of innovation. And then you look at the history of style. I mean, if you just look right here mm -hmm. and this one foot, mm -hmm. right? How many, how many brands are pulling off of these today? right off these designs. I mean, these designs were way ahead of their time. They took tremendous risk. It was about being beautiful. It was about being relevant. It was about history. It was about New York, mm -hmm. right? They drew a lot of inspiration from here. That inspiration is all around us. Joseph always, that was a thing. This Bilobo was born from that. Accutron was born from technology and, mm -hmm. and style and art and what is relevant in the world, even social, socially what's relevant in the world. Which is your favorite, just out of interest? I guess Space View. Space View, yeah, of course, right. In the 1960s, um, Accutron was the technology. It represented America, it represented the new technology. So it became not only the uh, Bulova was a clock on Air Force One, mm -hmm. the, the presidential uh, planes, but it became the official gift of state by the President of the United States. So we, here we have one that would have been given out. Um, and what they did is they converted a, um, an Accutron space view mm. to a clock. And this is solid brass, this is extremely heavy. Um, and we have a picture of uh, President Lyndon Johnson giving one of those clocks to a, um, a prime minister. We have to understand those unfamiliar with, um, with Accutron, if you missed the last video. At the time, this was pre-quartz. So this was cutting edge, this was the most accurate uh, yes. timing technology. It was in satellites, it was in the moon mission uh, aircraft, so it, it was a point of pride. Not only a point of pride, it was revolutionary. It was the first revolution in timekeeping in 300 years. Right. I mean, it was a, a totally uh, a new technology. Right. And uh, you see the ad here, why you should wear an Agatron instead of a watch. 
Yeah, you know, right. it, it took it to a an entirely new level. And so it was launched on October 25th, 1960 in Basel. That was the start of a, a journey. And I remember you had the, the tuning fork, the actual tuning yes. fork. Yes. So this uh, tuning fork was a, something commemorative uh, that was given out in Basel in, in 1960 for anybody who attended the launch of the brand. And you were telling me earlier that the, the, the coil that's wrapped around this uh, to, to, for the magnet is like it's, it's very difficult to manufacture because it was thinner than a human hair. Oh, it much was, thinner than human hair. I think yeah. it was something like 8,000 turns uh, to create that coil. Right. And it had to be so thin that uh, it could be, when it was wrapped up, it wouldn't be too large. Mm -hmm. But it had to be contiguous with no bends, no kinks. Uh, very difficult to manufacture to the point that Bulova had to manufacture it on its own because they couldn't get anybody that had the precision that was necessary to develop that one. Wow. And that was in a story in the, yes. the, the, that beautiful building over there. Right. Yeah, Interesting there. story about that building is it was designed after the Federal Reserve Bank building. Ah, uh, yes, it looks so like So if you it, ever yeah. see the uh, Secretary of the Treasury, yeah. uh, you say, what? what is that he or she doing in front of the Bulova building? No, right. that, right. it's the other right. way around. Right, got it, got it. Show me uh, some of your favorite pieces that you really... <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because everybody's going to have their favorite piece, okay. right? And it's always very unique and specific style-wise. And we talked, and well, I'll finish at the piece we talked about with the military piece. That was a clock that was on a dashboard, but a lot of collectors let's, pull let's off and... You want to look at it right yeah, now? So, where is our piece at? Right here, right, right, here. right? With what we've done here is we have these little dashboard clocks that were inside of you know, working aircraft, right? I mean, these are military mission run pieces and you can find those out there in the world. You bring them, pull them back and a lot of collectors, will eat, some guys even keep the nubs on for the connectors, for the electronic right. connectors. But all you gotta do is put lugs on that and make a watch out of it. So people wear those watches. One guy ju I just saw doubled one up. So it's a double. Nice. Yeah, it's, nice. and it's amazing looking, right? Nice. But I think what's great about Accutron today is we really draw from the collectors. We draw from what's happening in the world and we let them define where we need to be because you know we're we're a brand for the people right like that's just what we've always been it's mm -hmm. Joseph was always very appreciative of what was happening in the world and he understood the opportunity he had and he just wanted to pay that back so we continue to try to pay that back to our collectors and I mean that's how history is not only established but maintained and 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 kind of gone forward and we, we I think we do that incredibly well and we do it unlike anybody else like why am I here I'm a collector they found me five four Three, two, one, liftoff. We have liftoff at 9.34 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Bulova participated in 46 space missions, wow. but not just in uh, watches, but um, uh, timing devices, clocks, altimeters. Uh, without Bulova, they would never have gotten to the moon. Right. General Omar Bradley was the last five-star general of the United States, but he was the uh, chairman of the board of Bulova from 1958 to 1974. Wow. And so a lot of the connection with the government, I think, was because of the relationship that he had um, with the government mm -hmm. and um, everything from missile guidance systems to telescopes uh, right. was extremely strong. Uh, it's almost like um, you know a Raytheon would be today, but. Uh, Consumers thought of it from the watches, but the government uh, really relied on Bulova. He had his own watch, right? He had the, with the, the stars. Yeah. As chairman, you could do a few things, uh, like have uh, customized watches. So right. um, we had our own dial department, and we could customize. So what he did was promoted the fact that he was the last five-star general. So he would have a watch made with five stars. Um, and we have one here in the archives, which has five stars between the center post and the six o'clock position. And it was reported that 12 times throughout his career, he gave away his watch. Right. For somebody he wanted to thank or recognize, uh, he would give it to them. So we actually have two in the museum, one on loan and one that we, uh, we now own. Uh, and so it's sort of like having a piece of history, you know that he wore that watch and he was right. so important not only to the United States, but to the, to the company as well. Bulova was extremely important in the military. We um, had uh, military watches even going back to 1918 in World War I, which was really the kickoff for men's wrist watches. Right, right, because right. prior to that, it was really pocket watches. Pocket watches yeah. There's been a recent school, the Veterans Watchmakers Initiative, um, launched maybe three years ago, and I went down for the launch. And somebody who went to the Joseph Bulova School was inspired by the, the veterans of today mm -hmm. coming back from all kinds of different war situations. 
The Bulova Corporation, Joseph Bulova and Artie Bulova, trained an entire generation of disabled veterans as watchmakers, almost 2,000. And that to me was what had to be done here. The unemployment rate for disabled veterans is 84%. All they want is a chance to restore that dignity of purpose. If you come to this program and you meet the criteria and you have the heart and desire and passion to be a watchmaker, we can do it. There are no disabilities at VWI. This little place has become home to a lot of people. Everything you see in this building was donated by people who care, including Bulova, which was a major funder in this project, and I thank them for that. So that really pulled it, you know, your heartstrings there. Of course. Um, but it was the same type of thing. Thousands of people went through the school. It's at no cost to the individuals. And Bulova started that school in 1945 wow. um, into the 19. Um, 80s. That's an actual ring from 1960, a graduation ring oh, wow. from the school. Engineering wise, I mean, I think the government understood that we were working on things that were just unique, you know, like things that no one else was doing. As worried as they were in World War II about technologies from overseas, we had kind of our own mm -hmm. secret missions going on, right? Mm -hmm. And and Bulova, the, the tuning fork, you know, you were plus six seconds a day and uh, four seconds maybe in your best case scenario on right. a mechanical. You went from for the first time ever, right, from the hundreds of years ago to where we were, there was no advancements in, in mechanical timepieces. And then all of a sudden, we went from plus minus four to six to 360 beats a second. Mm -hmm. So now, instead of missing the moon by hundreds of thousands of miles or whatever it is, we now can land wherever we want. It was always bigger than Joseph and Art Bulova. It was, it just always, and it, it still is. And yeah, you know what this reminds me of, now, now you tell me about how it was used navigationally. It's a mm -hmm. bit like, uh, are you familiar with John Harrison who did the, um, the marine chronometer? Oh yeah, yes. Yeah, so it was like, the, you know, saving ships, being able to figure out latitude, longitude. It's exactly like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We're not a manufactured history. Right. Like exactly. this is, there's so, again, so much meat on the bone, right? Yeah. It's so rich that yeah. you gotta kind of leave things out, you know, from Elvis Presley to, right. to the moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got it all covered. Picture the scene, I'm, I'm a, a potential customer, shall we say, right? So this extraordinary piece of equipment a salesman would have would have had this. Yes, a, a salesman would have brought this into a store in the 1960s. What you had to do is explain a little bit about the Accutron right. movement of the Accutron watch. Actually, originally, the space view was not something that Bulova created um, on its own. Right. Retailers said, "Let's. We'd love to see how that watch works." We showed them prototypes, mm -hmm. and they said, "Why don't you make that for the consumer?" Which right. is what Bulova did. But they also needed to communicate to the sales associates, to the retailers to then be able to communicate uh, to the uh, consumers. So they created this sales kit, um, which used to work. Um, you'd press the button, the um, coils would vibrate. It divides every second into 360 equal parts. The Accutron timepiece uses this tuning fork instead of the balance wheel. And it's so precise, we guarantee monthly accuracy within 60 seconds, two seconds a day and your jeweler will regulate this accuracy free. Accutron, issued to X-15 pilots by the United States government. So you could see how the movement worked and how the, how the watch was created, but you also needed a story to go along with it. And then the days before PowerPoint, you'd have to do that mechanically. Right. So there was a whole pitch here to explain how it worked and how accurate it was. Um, anyway, this is, um, I think, quite amazing from the, 1960s and we have this to show today we're in the accutron room now yeah. yep and it's i mean it is it is separate it's a different and evolved thought what i call and collectors call the up down day date mm -hmm. with the white mm -hmm. that white i mean that is just a beautiful that watch is beautiful i can wear that with a suit and people are going to want to talk about it and i can go out in jeans and a t-shirt and people are going to want to talk about it right i love the um how would you say vertically placed right date you know and you, what's interesting from a watch guy's perspective and right. gal's perspective is we you know as as watch people we look at these things and when you take a uh, an aperture an open 
piece on the dial and you try to fit something into it, try to draw that out. It's impossible to get those to align. And this is one of those great design cues that we had where we took the aperture, we changed the shape of it all and made it this, it's art, you know, it's art on your wrist. Our television screen back here kind of showing off, you know, the technology when it comes to the electrostatic and how beautiful, again, form and function, right? It was beautifully sculpted and this, this form it comes with the function of this incredible technology. I mean, literally it's lightning in a bottle. When you get in there and watch guys always have loops in their pockets, <laughs> right? And I always wanna see what's there. Um, you know, you can really get in there and really look at some of those beautiful details. This watch invites the wearer and the people who are viewing it you know, into yet another conversation. You know, mm. it says something about who's wearing ah, it. Back to the, the Mad Men. Uh... Right. It is the height of design and technology. Accutron, it's not a timepiece. It's a conversation piece. It really is a conversation piece. Yeah. And like I said before, you know, how many, how many business deals have I made because of my watches? How many new friends have I met and made? Yeah. And how many great conversations and opportunities to meet interesting people would I have not had? Not I had something so interesting as these legacy pieces which just say something different. Again, in the watch case in a store, when you look at Accutron, it doesn't look like anything else. And that's on purpose, right? We don't want it to be. There's a unique person that wants that unique piece. And with the straps and being able to move them around in color, you can make these limited edition legacy pieces one of one. We want that for this collection. It's a collector's watch made by collectors, designed by collectors, sold by collectors, and bought by collectors. I'm loving this because I, I swear being loving below for myself, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I'm yeah, loving this. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. No, we've in Joe, this is a funny <laughs> thing. We've, we've run the podcast. Uh, this is episode what P one Oh five, one Oh four. I lost count. Wow. But, something, oh. something like that. Something like yeah. that. So know. we've done it for over two years and we always talk about Bulova on the, on the back end. We're like, you know what? We should dedicate a whole episode to Bulova, but I personally don't feel like I, know much about Bulova. I know a little bit, but uh, I am so glad that we came across you because clearly you know a lot about Bulova. But yeah, why don't you talk to us about um, why Bulova is such a big part of your life? I, you know, I had I had a conversation. I was talking with, with my co-hosts about it. And from a vintage standpoint, when you're looking at the, the company from from a historical standpoint, from from way back, you know, right. Joseph Bulova immigrating from Bohemia, right. goes to work at Tiffany, and then opens up his own shop and right. starts selling stuff out in New York. Their current museum and offices are in the Empire State Building. I mean, you know, mm. that's the American dream, man. Right, right. So they went, they went hard and they went deep. They were one of the first companies to start with the, the assembly line for manufacturer. And then you get into the designs and the, the dial stuff like that. They had the women's watches. They had the first bits of advertising that were done nationally. Right. The world right. runs on bull the time. They had Frank Sinatra as a spokesperson. I mean, you know, the company's got some legs. You know, I'm proud of this team in general. I mean, I'm here to just help, right? It's just the inspiration part. But to be able to see the people that they bring on board, like Carl, and how much he adds in richness and, you know, collectors from all over the world. I mean, I'm just lucky enough to be here today with you. Being able to kind of create these new technologies, but make them beautiful. They're not just engineers, they're sculptors. Like, you know, I kind of almost get upset when people refer to them solely as engineers, you know, mm -hmm. because there's so much form involved in how we do this. And if you just take a look at the large in dice wheel and then or well the, that that large wheel up for the second hand and then the two bottom plates mm -hmm. if you just take those shapes and how they connect and you removed it off it's a beautiful textile mm -hmm. almost like we have back here and on the back of the brand like oh, wow. i didn't even notice that yeah. isn't that beautiful yeah, yeah. right so imagine <laughs> that as a pocket square right, right. like oh, there's yeah. so much beauty and that's those are things like as a collector i was just telling you i have pocket squares that are mimicking those things right i have yes. that made i take pictures out of the empire state building and have it printed and worn with the colorization and yeah. it allows us to be unique yeah. and it celebrates that uniqueness in those people and those collectors and and the designers of it so what am i most proud of i'm most proud of the fact that we have artists creating these timepieces. Right. Again, that's why I'm so thankful and appreciative of the brand and humbled that they they want to share our opinion. And I try to rope in as many people as I can. Nice. I'm on the 29th floor of the Empire State Building, yeah. <laughs> like every day saying, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. You know, like I really, it's a, I do, I appreciate it. Good for you, man, yeah. good for you. But, and this is the original Computron? Oh, wow. Which we recreated. 
I noticed a lot with the advertising, it was very, had themes kind of relevant to that period. Yes, yeah, so this was from 1974, if you remember the Equal Rights Amendment came out in 1972, and it was equal pay, equal time. And this for Accutron was to show that we had watches both for women as well as men. Uh, we have a lot of people who would love us to run this ad today, yeah. <laughs> but it, uh, you know, it, it's an historical one, but it, you know, it says that Bulova has been on the forefront from, on social issues uh, through their advertising Ooh. and how they communicate and relate to their consumers. Oh, that's fantastic. At one point I had enough watches, I could wear three watches a day every day for five years, oh, and you'd never God. see the same watch. But you know, it's much smaller, the collection these yeah, days. My yeah. wife's much more pleased with that. <laughs> but the pieces I have today are significant and they're worn for me to be inspired. I don't care if you see them or you don't see them. Mm -hmm. I know what's on my wrist and today I had certain things that I was working on certain meetings and I wear my watches to inspire me. So the one is about luxury, mm -hmm. right? The one is about uh, first. This is, 14 carat, this is uh, solid 14 nice. carat alpha. Right. Um, and this was one of the first designs that they did. It's the one that you would see in most of the first pieces of advertising mm -hmm. for Accutron. But a beautiful timepiece. I love it in white gold. Very but it's, discreet. Yeah, right? Yeah. And so, but this watch, when it comes out from underneath, people, what are you wearing? Yeah. What, may I see that? And that's what it's about, right? So now we can connect. Mm -hmm. And watches should be about connection. They mm -hmm. should be about conversation. Mm -hmm. um, this watch was something that one of the designers said, hey, we have some ideas, we're doing some things. Can, you know, do you know this watch? And I was like, I actually brought it as, you know, right. part of my weekly right. wear. The, the bracelet has a little stretchy uh, in the clasp. It's, it's genius. They, right. They, it's, they need to do this again. You know? It's super cool, right? Yeah. And that is those those little, that piece. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. So now you don't have to make an adjustment. You don't have to. And a lot of watches, especially, you know, this bracelet's beautiful, the bullet yes. bracelet. It almost yeah. is like a bandolero right. kind of thing. Right, right. Um, it's super comfortable. Yeah. But for me, especially, you know, listen, I, I like to eat sometimes, right. and as my weeks and months go by, I don't have to make adjustments constantly. You know, yes. it's hot out. Maybe I had a, a great, some great dim sum, right. a little more salt <laughs> in it. So yeah, this watch kind of works with me. I have to be honest, my watches, as I became a collector, became kind of the favorite part of my life. I, I got business deals, new jobs, met new friends, mm -hmm. um, all because I'm wearing three watches. People, what are you wearing? Like, right. wh who wears three watches? Well. Let me tell you, yeah. right? And now we become friends. And what do you wear? What's your thing? What's yeah. your, you know, and, and whether it's watches or it's shoes or it's, you know, right. pocket, pocket squares. squares. Yeah, probably my favorite piece here, uh, the, the Elvis watch. Oh, okay. So, so please tell us about the Elvis watch. Yeah, um, Elvis Presley, uh, anti, uh, entertainer, um, was a watch guy. He mm -hmm. loved uh, new technology and this particular watch I think was a sort of a trophy on his wrist that he could own the latest and greatest in technology. Mm -hmm. It's solid gold. We, to be right. yes. we were able to obtain it for the museum. It's um, asymmetric which in the uh, bracelet version it's not as you don't see it as, as prominent but it is an asymmetric design which was common in the 1960s mm -hmm. like the old Avanti cars. Yes. A little mm -hmm. bit um, um, off, um, and this particular watch has EP engraved on the case back. Oh, amazing! For Elvis Presley. Amazing. So um, sometimes I'll take this out and let people try it on, and right. they <laughs> feel like they're <laughs> Elvis is in the room. Right. Amazing. Amazing. It's smaller than I thought. So aside from having the Citizen Group uh, based there, as well as Belova, Akitron and all the rest, there's a fantastic exhibit. Uh, this is a huge giant display of screen showing all the movies featuring the Empire State Building. And then of course we go up to the 86th floor and then later we'll go up to the observatory in just a moment, uh, which is very, very small. It's been about 12 years since I've been up here perfect place for some wristwatch checks now don't forget to hashtag wristwatch check uh, to get featured on the Instagram and do follow the Instagram by the way and you can see Astoria Queens where I used to live for over a decade and started the channel incredible views I mean it's almost surreal it looks just like a big Lego set to be honest and this part is actually new the observatory You're not really cognizant of uh, how far up you are but yeah definitely worth the visit gotta say a massive thank you to Bulova for hosting and uh, allowing us to share this wonderful experience and yeah don't forget to like this video thank you so much for watching and i will catch you in the next